Salamat Panginoon sa iyong punga Misyon, kaloob sa aming puso Aming sarili ay aming handog Laging tapat at laging tugon Naririto handa kami, Panginoon Hayo sa ipat ibang dako, hatid ang iyong salita at paglilingkod. Inang Maria, siyang gabay na mitugod, lalagan at alam ng iyong misyon. Inang taong Kaya, salamat Panginoon sa iyong kuna. Misyon, kaluhok sa aming puso. Aming sarili ay aming kanto. Laging tapat at laging tugon. Naririto hangga kami, Panginoon. Kaloob na aking alay sa mundo Katarungan, kapanalan, kapayapaan Sa senyal na ito, maniniwala ang mundo Pagmamahal namin sa bawat tao Tapat at laging tukon Naririto hangga kami Panginoon Naririto Handa kami episode of the CBCP Episcopal Commission on Missions Mission Catechesis for the year 2021, although it is actually already our fourth episode. Pero bago po ang lahat, nais naming batiin ang Quiapo Church or ang Minor Basilica of the Black Nazarene ng isang maligayang kapistahan ng poong Nazareno, lalong-lalo na po sa mga deboto. There is a fiesta mass every hour today, so for those who would like to join the online masses for the Feast of the Black Nazarene, just head over to the Facebook page of Quiapo Church. In the meantime, we continue with our fourth episode for our mission catechesis based on the book of Father James Kroger, Go Teach, Make Disciples. If you would remember, we had our very, very first episode with Father James Kroger himself on the Church Documents on Mission or Encyclicals on Mission. And our second episode was with Father Manuling Francisco 
on Jesus and His mission. And we also had our third episode last year with Dr. Jake Yap of the Loyola School of Theology on Mary as Evangelist. And today, we continue with a true inspiration in mission for the entire Catholic Church, St. Paul. But of course, before that, as always, we begin with a prayer to be led today by Father Eric Villa, who joins us all the way from California. Although actually, Father Eric was a native of Mandaluyong and a product actually of the Lorenzo Mission Institute the Missionary Seminary of the Archdiocese of Manila. But he is also a product of St. Patrick's Seminary in Menlo Park, California, where he earned his Bachelor's in Sacred Theology and his Master's in Divinity. Currently, Father Eric is Parochial Administrator of the St. Raymond Parish, and he is also actively involved in the Catholic Daughters of the Americas and the Legion of Mary as spiritual director. Let us put ourselves in the holy presence of God. I am Father John Eric Villia, currently assigned here at St. Raymond's Church in the Diocese of Oakland, California. We thank you for joining us today as we continue our series on the 500 years of the Christianity in the Philippines, dubbed as Ikalimang Siglo, Kasama Si Cristo. As we begin the new year, we are blessed to have before us this amazing opportunity to explore the life of St. Paul and his mission of evangelization. His dramatic conversion on the road to Damascus is the beginning of an incredible journey. And while not all conversion stories are as dramatic and startling as his, each of us is commissioned by Jesus himself to live in obedience to him, to love one another in his name, to know him and the power of his resurrection, and to tell the world of the fullness of life through him, with him, and in him. The mission of the Diocese of Oakland proclaims to know Christ better and to make him better known. And such is our call and duty by virtue of our baptism. To be evangelizers of our time and like St. Paul, to reflect the light of Christ to the world. To truly be extensions of his hands and feet, heart and voice to wherever we find ourselves called to serve. Let us pray. Gracious God, we praise you for your salvation that you have offered to all people. We praise you for Jesus, who reveals your light to the nation. Like St. Paul, help us to live in this light each day and to reflect this same light to all corners of the world. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Eric. And now we have a returning guest. If you would remember, Jello Francisco gave a mission testimony last November on how he found his mission in music in the United States. And when we learned that part of his mission was putting together the Philippine Chamber Singers LA, we just had to hear them sing. So for our opening song, we are blessed to have once again Jello Francisco and the Philippine Chamber Singers to sing Light of a Million Mornings. Lalaganap at lab ng iyong I 
couldn't see the sunshine through the shadow. I couldn't seem to find a soul to care. But in my darkest hour, you touched me with your power. And when I looked, your light was everywhere. The light of a of Light of a Million Mornings. Thank you so much to the Philippine Chamber Singers LA and of course to Maestro Jello Francisco. And now for our main talk today on St. Paul, we have the honor of listening to the reflection of Bishop Alejandro Alex Aklan, who joins us from LA, although he is actually a native of Pasay, but he has been a priest in LA for more than two decades now. And he is currently the Episcopal Vicar of the San Fernando Pastoral Region of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, California. 
Bishop Aklan as the auxiliary bishop for the LA Archdiocese is only the second Filipino-American priest to be named bishop in the United States. Let us listen to the talk on St. Paul of Bishop Aklan. Magandang araw po sa inyong lahat. In preparation for the National uh, Mission Congress to be held in Cebu this coming April, the topic I would like to share with you my personal experience of has to do with the mission principles that guided the ministry of St. Paul. Father James Crager, a Jesuit, in his book, Go, Teach, Make Disciples, lists 10 of these mission principles. A few of these ring very true for me. And I would like to share with you how they have manifested themselves in my own life. The first is a deep awareness of one's vocation. I must say that until I was a couple of years in the seminary and finally ordained as a priest, my awareness of what my vocation was very, very little or none at all. Prior to that, life was about building a career, raising a family, cultivating relationships, and having enough savings to retire comfortably, like I'm sure many of you are doing and thinking of at this time. The idea that God could choose me to serve him in a particular way to bring about God's kingdom was as foreign to me as an alien from one of Jupiter's moons. Anyway, it happened. Priests and lay folks in my first parish in the Los Angeles area identified me as one who has a vocation to the priesthood and supported me with prayers and encouragement to go through the discernment process before and during seminary to ordination and then in my ministry as a priest. Kind of embarrassing, but you know, I was one of the oldest seminarians during my seminary days. Just like St. Paul, whose path to apostleship was drawn in crooked lines, mine was rather similar, maybe even with a little bit more twists and turns. In Acts chapter 9, verse 15, the Lord tells Ananias, this man, meaning Paul, is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. To Ananias, who was scared to death of Paul, is still called Saul then, because Paul was known for his persecution of Christians. Paul was far from perfect, but he yielded to God's choice of him to be God's apostle, and so he was able to do so much for the Lord. St. Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 9 to 10 go, I am the least of the apostles. In fact, since I persecuted the church of God, I hardly deserve the name apostle. But by God's grace, that is what I am. And the grace that he gave me has not been fruitless. For those of us who feel unworthy of the ministry that we have been blessed with, we only have to remember these words of St. Paul and thank God for his grace as we forge ahead in our service of the Lord. The next mission principle from Father Krager that I would like to touch on is how essential for mission one's relationship with Jesus and radical commitment to Christ are. A few years before entering the seminary, I got involved in the charismatic renewal movement in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. The gift of this group to me is the relationship with Jesus that developed from a participation in it, a relationship that is very personal, close, and enriching, one that is very loving. A far cry from my distant relationship with Jesus in the past, where I felt very much judged rather than being accepted for who I am warts and all. Can anyone else relate to that? You know, I'm 70. And when I was growing up, everything was sin, sin, sin. And I always heard hell, hell, hell. You know, and I don't know how many of you grew up in an environment like that. But that kind of like stumps your ability to really do good, because you're just so worried about making mistakes and being punished for it. 
but meeting a kind and merciful and loving God through a prayer community, this charismatic prayer community that I become a part of, who knew God to be kind and merciful and loving, and whose lives attested to the fact it was very liberating and freeing. And so as Philippians chapter verse, chapter one, verse 21 says, to me, life is Christ. And in Galatians chapter two, verses 19 to 20, I have been crucified with Christ. And I live now not with my own life, but with the life of Christ who lives in me. It's amazing how one is able to endure much trials when he or she lives his or her life in Christ. Remember what St. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 35 and following? He says, what will separate us from the love of Christ? Will anguish or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword? No. In all these things, we conquer overwhelmingly through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor present things, nor future things, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what else does the world, the flesh, and the dark forces have to throw at us? Nothing that we cannot handle with the help of Jesus Christ. St. Paul had a share of trials in the service of the gospel. He was imprisoned many times, beat up, shipwrecked, robbed, did hard labor, sleepless, hungry, thirsty, and gone naked as documented in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 27. Now, try topping those. But despite all that, St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, Therefore, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and constraints for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Father James Crager reminds all missionaries like St. Paul the need for them to say, May I never boast of anything but the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The next mission principle from Father Crager that is actively in play for me right now is the trying out of new insightful mission methods to bring people to Christ. New insightful mission methods. Our ways of communicating are constantly changing and changing faster and faster with the technology that is becoming available to us. Blackboards, whiteboards, easel stands, flip chart papers are out. Zoom, StreamYard, Flocknode, and Constant Connect are in. In the new reorganized Office of New Evangelization in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, a process by which individuals are formed to become missionary disciples was launched a few months ago and is unfolding nicely. The process involves guiding people to hear Jesus' call to be his disciple, to give their lives to Jesus as his disciple, and to go and make disciples of Jesus. Our Office of New Evangelization is using new technology and methodologies for optimal results. St. Paul himself was creative in his approach to evangelization. In the Acts of the Apostles, we read of trying new approaches to achieve his goal of spreading the good news, like preaching in a synagogue or a house nearby, explaining to his listeners the connections within the Jewish and Christian teachings and experiences, preaching even in the Areopagus, the central assembly place in, in Athens, talking about an unknown God and using a popular philosopher poet of his time to drive home his point. St. Paul was brilliant in adapting to situations to get across his message about Jesus Christ. He said, I have become all things to all to save at least one. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22. St. Paul is an inspiration to us all who want to bring souls to Christ. The last mission principle from Father Krager that I have time right now to say something about is commitment to social transformation. 
St. Paul was convinced that the gospel has the power to transform individual lives as well as communities. Once the gospel takes root in a person's heart, he or she will not be able to help it but preach and live out the gospel of freedom and liberation from sin and the consequences of sin while caring for the poor, the suffering, and the oppressed. This is what we are called to do as Christians in our time, wherever we find ourselves to be. I found this to be true even as a student in college. The pastor on a group that I was a member of at the University of Santo Tomas sang at daily mass regularly and was routinely nourished by the, by the Eucharist. Moved by the gospel, a group of us went to a combination prison drug rehabilitation center in Cavite every month or so to minister to the inmates there, which I hope was as transforming to the prisoners we ministered to as much as it was transforming for us who visited them. That experience kept some of us involved in prison ministry way after we had moved on from the university. That was definitely true for me. As a priest, I regularly went to minister to inmates in a few jails and juvenile halls. That ministry led me to get involved in community organizing work, to give voice to the voiceless so that their neighborhoods would be safer, their lives would be improved, and so that immigrants would not be harassed by law enforcement and immigration officers. St. Paul addressed many barriers that separated people of his time. Religious barriers, social barriers, economic barriers, and cultural barriers. That is why he writes in Galatians uh, chapter 3, verse 28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free person, there is not male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Around the Eucharistic table, we, the baptized, are gathered together as one, without distinction. Father James Craig writes about the importance of collaboration with co-workers in the vineyard of the Lord. St. Paul knew this and associated himself with ministers who supported him and whom he supported to do God's work in their midst. There was Barnabas, Mark, Timothy, Silvanus, Titus, Luke, Erastus, Aristarchus, Tychicus, and many others. There are so many Catholics around us who can inspire us immediately around us, far away from us. They, they do so much for the Lord, maybe much more than we have ever done or can imagine to do. They gift us with so much hope and inspiration. May our work for the Lord bring more disciples to Jesus who will help build God's kingdom here on earth. And so in conclusion, allow me to say a prayer over you. Lord God, in your loving kindness, you sent your son to be our shepherd and guide. Continue to send workers into your vineyard to sustain and direct your people. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Magandang araw po ulit sa inyong lahat. Thank you so much for that heartwarming talk, Bishop Aklan. We are inspired by your journey in mission that was also somehow inspired by St. Paul. Truly, we can find our mission by grace through faith. And now, let's listen to two young future priests who are now on their own journeys of faith. They are called discerners to priesthood of the Archdiocese of L.A. May I introduce Jeric Alenton, who is only 23 years old and a native of Cebu City. He moved to the U.S. in 2006 and entered college formation for the Archdiocese of Los Angeles in 2016. And Paul Laxon, only 21 years old, who is a first-generation Filipino-American and has been discerning a possible vocation to the priesthood. Let us listen to their mission testimonies. So my name is Jarek Allenton. I was born in April 8, 1997 in Cebu, Philippines. 
I came here in the U.S. when I was about, I think, nine years old. That was like third grade in 2006. So basically, I grew up in Cebu with my grandparents since my mom worked abroad as a caregiver. And my dad worked in Dubai and he was, uh, I think, engineering. Um, the last memory I had of my mom in the Philippines was when I was about I think, three to two years old. This was around 2000. And that was the last time I ever saw her until I came to the US. I'm, yeah, I'm the first generation um, American born in my family. So my, my grandparents and my great grandparents immigrated to the US as well as my mom with them and then my dad came alone. Um, and my mom and dad met here in LA. So they, they grew up, in, or they, they settled in Detroit. Um, that's where they were offered jobs as immigrants um, in healthcare. Well, I was very privileged, I was very blessed to, to grow up here in, in the United States. Um, and, and just to kind of experience how, how it is to, to, to live in, in a Filipino-American household. Um, but it's definitely not the typical American um, like lifestyle. So it was a weird in between because you would go to your friend's house and they're like, "Why are you taking off your shoes?" You know. <laughs> My mom, before she took me here, she would always tell me how the U.S. was, and she would always say, "Oh, it's like a city." And then she knew that I was into like religious images since I was little in the Philippines. That's what I always wanted for Christmas and for my birthdays. It was always like to get a, a Santo or a Santo Nino. And she, she basically like told me that, oh, there's a big store here in the US. <laughs> if you go here, there's like, you can pick whatever you want. <laughs> and then I came here, it was like, I remember it's like in December, like December 15. I, I asked her like, where's the store? <laughs> and she said it was way different. And I kind of have like this feeling of missing it home. Mm -hmm. Because of all like how the Philippines is with all like January, there's the Santo Nino and then for Holy Week, the Holy Week stuff, the processions and that was the thing, it's like I, I got used to that growing up and when I came to the US, it's like there's none of those and it's, they would take me, like the church from my town, my hometown in Cebu, in Aragao is uh, built in like 1700s and it's like an old Baroque church and looking up in the ceiling, I could always see like they painted like stories from the Bible, and, and ne from the front towards the altar, there's the seven sacraments, and then there's like the Trinity with the Virgin Mary, and then there's like they're like a fountain gushing from them, and then bottom there's like people uh, holding like vessels like cups. And they're like catching water from that fountain flowing from the Trinity. And I remember that looking at it <laughs> used to scare me because I always think that <laughs> at night all those statues and the paintings <laughs> would move. Oh, and I, I was always afraid to go closer to the altar because the statues are like way bigger. <laughs> and that's I, from my barangay, there's two of them. We have uh, San Pedro and Santa Veronica. Okay. So my grandfather <laughs> would always go with the San Pedro because. He says it's good luck for sabong, <laughs> for cockfighting. Then, makadaog daw siya. Then, dua man sa unsa na masyao. So, <laughs> iyang ipangayo dito ni San Pedro na ang mga numeron sa masyao gloto <laughs> mugawas. Okay, I wish I could say the same thing. I mean, like you know, as a kid, I I hated going to church. Like I I grew up here, and and like you know, my earliest memory. Is like you know we would pray the rosary every night and and there there would always be religious images in our household like there's even like when i was three years old there's still a picture of me and it's a picture of me kneeling in front of the of, of, in front of a statue of the virgin mary with a rosary in my hand but as a kid i i just wanted to play with my toys i wanted to play games i wanted to watch tv growing up in la like in even here in the San Fernando Valley, it's like, you know, you, you're exposed to immigrant families and, and kids of immigrant families that, that have the same experience. You know, like, like I said earlier, it's, it's different from being American, like, you know, that where the family's been here for a long time and different from being in the Philippines. It's like that weird in between. So there's that, always that tension there. Like it, it all pretty much, it, it really came to a head and, and like, I think I was more vocal about my disbelief and and especially what we were being taught in school was just contradictory to, to things that we were taught 
in religious ed. And that really, like, it really just cut me to the heart. It's like, you know, like it was just really not a reality in my life until you meet someone that actually does live that reality. It, it, it definitely, it definitely made God a reality, not because he is a reality, but because it puts the love story into your life, that you are a part of salvation history. And this is a God that, you know, is willing to, to engage in that kind of personal relationship. And so when, when, when the love story came into my life, that love story of, of Jesus Christ, then it wasn't chores anymore. It wasn't something that I didn't want to do. It, it wasn't something that, that I was being forced to do. It was a choice in my life. It's like, you know what? I choose to live out that love that I encountered in, in other people, in the sacraments, in, in, in the community, you know? All of these things like really come to a head and and I was like, you know, it was just such an <laughs> I was like I was like crying like so so much like in that year I was like wow oh, this is amazing <laughs> you know like because when when you encounter that that kind of love it definitely it it just impacts your inner being. But when I entered seminary I always had this mentality like oh I got this it's like this is easy. This is like, if I just get used to the schedules, like everything will fall into place. But then, like as that for my first year went through, I realized like, like how much I was relying more on myself than on God, and that I wasn't. recognized that the whole problem was that I was always focused on what I can do. Like I always thought like, my whole faith relies on me doing stuff like praying, going to mass. And if like if I say enough prayers, like I'll get whatever I want. And basically entrusting my whole self to him, and that accepting like every moment of my life as God, like inviting me to put my whole trust in Him rather than on myself. And yeah, most, yeah. and and I remember from that passage from Romans, and then I related it to a, a prayer for the Novena for the Dead that we always pray in the Philippines. It was like on the ninth day and the prayer was, uh, it was talking about how the spear that pierced Jesus' side opened us to the heart of Christ. And that in that prayer it asked us to, uh, that spear opened our hearts too and so that our hearts may be taken out and be uh, become one heart with Jesus and Mary, a heart that is loving a heart that is always willing to fulfill God's will. And, and to Paul Axon. <laughs> and to Paul Axon, uh, to me, um, to me, this is, you know, that, that is, that is what my life is. You know, it's, you know, you, you can always say, you know, your vocation story or, or what it is, you know, when, when people say that, whether it's your vocation story or your discernment, that is just, that's just a part of salvation history. It's a slice, you know? We, we, we live in a particular moment in history where God doesn't only want to encounter us, but, but He also wants the world to encounter who He is through us, you know? So, since I'm from Cebu, Santo Nino is like a big thing. It's like, I remember growing up, my mom was a devotee of Santo Nino, so we had a Santo Nino. But yeah, when she was feeling lonely and homesick, she would always talk to Santo Nino as like, like someone present and like as a friend. And that was her way of praying and that, that's what touched me. And later on when I was reading the history, uh, I read that account from Magellan's voyage where they described the first baptisms and how the Queen of Cebu was presented three images and that the one that caught her attention was the image of the Santo Nino and that when she saw that she was in tears and asked for the image and he comes to us as a little child and that it's easy to talk to him as if like a little child and that's how I grew up I guess when I pray because I always say 
uh, Senor Santolino helped me with this and it's like I'm talking to a little kid Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mary, Mother of God, pray for us in the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for your very candid mission testimony, Jarek and Paul. We wish you well on your journey and can't wait to call you Father Jarek and Father Paul. And now we end our program with a prayer to be led by Monsignor Joel Saldon Monte de Ramos, who is Mission Director of the Pontifical Mission Societies and Vicar General of the Diocese of Dipolog. Let us put ourselves in the holy presence of God. Paul's new relationship with God brought him to a new life, a new lifestyle. His new life brought him intense joy. His joy and happiness persisted even in weakness. Insults, hardships, persecutions, and difficulties only increase his joy in serving God. The central reason and driving force behind his missionary activities was his love for Jesus, for whom he witnessed zeal was his response to Christ's initiative. This zeal did not diminish even when he was chained like a criminal because God's message cannot be chained. It raced ahead and penetrated everywhere. Paul spent quite a bit of time in prison in Acts Paul is in prison in Philippi and then spends last quarter of the book in various prisons. Jerusalem, Caesarea, ultimately ending the book under house arrest in Rome. The letters of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon were all pinned from prison. Second Timothy was also written from prison, likely Paul's final imprisonment in Rome prior to his martyrdom. So one might say that Paul spent large portions of his ministry quarantined in isolation against his will, but never alone, for God is always with him. I do think that we can draw some analogies between Paul's experience and our own current circumstances of physical distancing, the widespread disruption of our patterns of normalcy and temporary curtailments of certain freedoms we've long enjoyed. So how did Paul respond to his own imprisonment? When Paul informs the Philippians about his imprisonment, he astonishingly tells them that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. To many, Paul's circumstances seem calculated to hinder the gospel. But Paul responded 
with confident trust that by God's grace, the gospel will continue to advance. I believe we too can say with confidence that what is happening in our world will really serve to advance the gospel. I trust that in the coming weeks and months, we will hear stories of people coming to faith in Christ in ways brought about by this pandemic. This is a wonderful and humbling reminder that while God chooses to use us to accomplish His purposes, it does not depend on us. And that's good news. Even if we are silenced due to the pandemic or any persecution, the gospel will continue to advance. Nothing can hinder God's word to be preached to all nations. For a time, many of us are being prevented from gathering regularly and from normal routines of life and work. In the face of such interruption, we could easily put our faith up and numb ourselves by binging on various forms of entertainment to distract us from reality. Or we could commit to utilizing this unplanned and forced change in our habits to train ourselves to become more intimate with God. Our time of social distancing can help us to draw near to God and mend our nets through the reading and study of God's Word. We can commit to coming out of quarantine more Christ-like than we were going in. While many churches use technology to celebrate the Eucharist, to shepherd, and to deliver God's word, nothing can replace gathering together in person as the body of Christ. The more we long to be reunited in person with our brothers and sisters, the sweeter the reunion will be. My dear brothers and sisters, the Spirit does not stop working, and so the mission keeps going. Even in this time of pandemic, with or without us. But the fact is, you and I are given a share in the mission of the Son and the Spirit, not because we are good, but because God is. The new normal for a time being could easily seem like our own spiritual growth as individuals and as flat as well as the advance of the gospel among the lost and marginalized, we necessarily be stunted. It sometimes feels like the word of God is being isolated along the rest of us, but it isn't because nothing can stop God's word, not prison, not persecution, not even a virus. Though many around the world are suffering, and many others distracted and dispirited through restrictions, lockdowns, quarantines, anxiety, and fears, the Word of God is not bound. It can never be quarantined. It always runs free. It always accomplishes what God wants it to do, to continue to take ground and capture hearts. Paul had done his part in preaching the gospel. Our challenge is to continue what he had done. It is now our responsibility to cooperate in God's work in preaching the gospel to all nations. May I invite you to pray. O oh God, our rock of safety, and our shelter in stormy times. Listen to our cries and calm our fears during this time of crisis, in moments of doubt, during periods of isolation, through seasons of uncertainty. 
Like St. Paul, we place our trust in you. Help us as we celebrate the year of Miso Agendas and the 500 years of Christianity in our country. To persevere through these difficult days with renewed faith, we trust in your compassionate care and with the patience to hold on. Fill us with the courage to face whatever happens and the common sense to follow public health directives until the threat of the disease is diminished. Friends and loved ones are able to reunite without fear. People get back to work safely and communities of faith gather once again joyfully to give you thanks and sing your praise. We ask this for Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, and through the intercession of our Blessed Mother, the star of evangelization. Amen. Thank you so much, Monsignor Joel. Now, we can't possibly end this episode without listening once again to the beautiful voices and harmony of the Philippine Chamber Singers LA. But before we call them back, do like and follow the Facebook page of the CBCP Episcopal Commission on Mission because we will be continuing with a mission catechesis every second Saturday of the month at 3 p.m. And every last Saturday of the month, also at 3 p.m., beginning this January, the CBCP Episcopal Commission on Mission, in collaboration with various organizations, will also be having webinars for the Year of Misho Agendas. So, watch out for that. Thank you so much for watching. See you on January 30 for the first webinar of the CBCP Episcopal Commission on mission for the year of Misho Ad Gentes. And now we close this program with a beautiful rendition of your heart today, once again by Maestro Jello Francisco and the Philippine Chamber Singers LA. Have a wonderful weekend, happy Feast of the Black Nazarene, and have a happy Holy New Year. Thank you for watching. Banalan kapayapaan Sa senyal na ito maniwala ang mundo Pagmamahal